Stanford University. The first lecture of the series is going to be by uh, Agostino Marinelli. He is uh, obviously Italian, and, but he's from Rome also. Uh, he got his PhD from UCLA in 2012, and he was a postdoc at Slack uh, right after that in 2012. And uh, he's been working on um, <coughs> accelerators, and uh, hopefully he will tell us about um, his, uh, various uh, accelerator technologies, inclu including how to make several pulses with various delays and different frequencies. Um, and he's been at Slack as a Panofsky Fellow in since 2015, and he's been doing great things uh, here. Um, so I'm looking forward to your talk. Yes, thanks. So thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Agostino Marinelli. I work in the R&D group here the, at Slack. I do R&D on the LCLS. So I'm an accelerator physicist. I'm the type of person you call when you want to make trouble and use some, some fancy new uh, FEL scheme. Um, I have also the honor to introduce you to the um, high-tech uh, teaching device that Matthias the device. Is Matthias here? OK. So I, I don't know how he in, intended to fold this, but you have this because gonna, we're going to ask you questions uh, halfway through the lecture. And uh, the answers are going to be color-coded. So you, you're going to raise your hand, pick whatever color you think is right, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, see. we'll see how good of a job we're doing at teaching. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be giving you a lecture on the uh, physics of uh, free electron lasers. Uh, here's the outline of my talk. I'll, I'll start from uh, describing what an undulator is. I'll briefly talk about android radiation. And then I think this is the most interesting part, radiation from many particles and the FEL instability. These two are obviously related. And then, uh, uh, depending on how fast I go, we'll talk a little bit about advanced uh, FEL concept, the, the R&D we're doing here at the uh, LLCLS and other FELs worldwide. So uh, Mike Dan's done an excellent job of uh, introducing you to, to the FEL, but uh, I'll reiterate the concept. Uh, what's an X-ray field electron laser? Uh, well, it, it's essentially the, the brightest uh, X-ray source that exists right now. It's uh, about 10 orders of magnitude uh, brighter than a synchrotron. And it's, uh, uh, the ing ing ingredients of an FEL are, uh, well, a uh, high energy LINAC for angstrom radiation, uh, angstrom level radiation in about 5 to 15 GeVs, and a long undulator. We'll see during the lecture why the undulator has to be long. Uh, and well, it's called a free electron laser because it shares many properties of a conventional laser. So high power, uh, short pulses, about 4 to 100 femtoseconds. Uh, narrow bandwidth, you can go all the way down to 0.1 per, so, sorry, it, you start from 0.1%, which is the natural bandwidth of a typical X-ray free electron laser. And uh, if you're clever, uh, you can do some seeding or self-seeding scheme and you go, go down to uh, uh, much lower than that, 0.005% uh, is the bandwidth of a self-seeded X-ray free electron laser. And uh, during this lecture, I'll explain why this happens, but a free electron laser uh, uh, amplifies uh, uh, radiation either from a small external seed or from spontaneous radiation through an exponential instability and delivers very high peak powers, like I said, about uh, 10, or, uh, 10 orders of magnitude brighter than uh, a typical synchrotron light source. Now, um, FEL physics has been the subject of uh, a lot of research over about 40 years. It started in 78 with John Mady's uh, uh, first paper. He was a grad student here at Stanford. And uh, over the years, people have uh, understood more and more about this uh, device. So John Mady originally conceived the FEL as, a, as an oscillator, as a low-gain device where you introduce some feedback with uh, uh, mirrors. And uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, my fellow Italians, uh, Claudio Pellegrini and, and Rodolfo Bonifacio, together with uh, uh, some uh, scientists in Russia, uh, Evgeny Saldin and uh, his co-workers, well, they found this uh, uh, high-gain regime where uh, essentially if your beam is bright enough, you don't need mirrors to induce a feedback uh, uh, on the, from the radiation to the electrons. Just the beam will do that uh, by itself and the radiation will grow uh, exponentially. And that really opened up uh, the field of X-ray uh, FELs because uh, as you can imagine, doing an X-ray oscillator is very challenging. People are trying to revisit the concept nowadays, but it's a lot easier to make a, a very bright beam, send in a long undulator and just let the instability do, do its job. Now, uh, FELs, uh, as Mike pointed out, they produce very beautiful experimental results. They've also produced very ugly equations. And uh, you know, if I was mean, I would spend the next hour and a half trying to walk you through the derivation of the three-dimensional uh, FEL model derived by another Stanford graduate student, Ming Shi. 
uh, as you can see, they're pretty uh, ugly equations. It's, uh, uh, this H is a non-Hermitian operator, so you, your final solution is going to be done in terms of some uh, 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 biorthogonal mo mode expansion, and you know, find your solution in terms of the eigenvalues of this equation. It's really ugly, so uh, we won't do that. I'll, uh, I'll try to walk you through the physics of, uh, of FELs, and I'll sprinkle here and there a few equations. And we won't derive any equations, but uh, if you're interested in, uh, in going through the equations in detail, we'll, uh, we'll uh, make uh, some lecture notes available uh, within the next couple of weeks. Now, going back to the physics of the FEL instead of the math, like I said, the ingredients of an FEL, well, you need a very high, uh, a very bright, a uh, high energy electron source, and then a long uh, undulator. And just uh, to understand the basics, the reason why you need a linear uh, accelerator is that the electrons that drive the FEL instability are very bright, they're very high current, so there's no way you could circulate them in a, in a storage ring because collective instabilities would destroy the, the beam in, in less than one turn. So what you do is you use uh, one LINAC, you use electrons once through the undulator, and then you throw them away. Now, we're talking about very uh, high energy beams, highly relativistic, so your uh, gamma uh, Lorentz factor is very much larger than one. Uh, just a reminder, the uh, gamma is, twice, uh, is roughly twice the energy in, uh, in MEVs. So we're typically, for hard X-ray fields, you're looking at uh, multi-GV beams, so gamma larger than uh, 10 to the 4. And uh, many of you may already know this. This is the uh, resonant wavelength, which is the central emission uh, uh, wavelength of a free electron laser. And uh, lambda wiggler is the period of the undulator. K is a dimensionless factor that's typically of order 1 normally larger than one, otherwise the gain is uh, not very good. So no, at LCLS it's 3.5, and gamma is the Lorentz factor. Now, lambda wiggler is typically, you know, two or three centimeters, k is of order one or two, and if you put in some numbers, you understand why you need multi-GV beams to get to angstrom, angstrom scale wavelengths. Now, the undulator. Well, the undulator, uh, uh, by the way, undulators, were of, of course, were not invented in the context of FELs. They existed already they were as in insertion devices in, uh, in synchrotron radiation light sources. Um, an undulator is a, a periodic array of uh, typhoid magnets with uh, alternating polarity. Lambda Wiggler is the period of, uh, uh, of this uh, magnetic field. And typically, in a, this is a planar undulator. In a planar undulator, you have a Y field that has a sinusoidal uh, uh, dependence on, uh, on Z. And of course, this makes the electrons wiggle, uh, wiggle in X. It's pretty straightforward to derive the equation of motions of electrons in an undulator. Well, the um, uh, uh, canonical momentum is, is conserved, so you can uh, uh, you know, just plug in all your, exp your expressions of your uh, uh, magnetic field. And what you get is that your transverse uh, beta oscillation, so your normalized transverse velocity, is k uh, over gamma times cosine of uh, kwz. Uh, and k is uh, this dimensionless parameter we talked about. It's essentially the normalized uh, uh, um, uh, vector potential of the undulator field. Now, just a quick uh, look at uh, uh, what electrons do in a, in a wiggler. They'll, like I said, they oscillate uh, transversely. Electrons with lower energy, uh, they make uh, uh, larger, uh, larger oscillations because you're a transverse velocity goes like 1 over gamma. And we'll see this is a key ingredient of your FEL uh, instability. Uh, in addition to planar undulators, you, you can also have helical undulators. And now you have an X and Y field. They, they make a, a helix. So this is the, your expression. And then, of course, your trajectory is also going to be a helix. And uh, so you have an, an X and Y component to your velocity. The beauty of the helical undulator is that the transverse velocity, the um, amplitude of the, trans the transverse velocity is constant. If you square these two and sum them, of course, you only get uh, k square, k, k square over gamma squared. Now, uh, the first thing we want to know about undulator radiation is the wavelength. And uh, how do we do this? Well, you can think this is your uh, electron orbit. And the electrons go very fast. They go almost at the speed of light, but not quite. So for every undulator period, uh, the radiation is going to slip ahead of your electrons uh, by a certain amount. And that amount is exactly your uh, 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 radiation period. So you have uh, a wavefront emitted when your electron is here. By the time the electron makes one oscillation, it emits a new wavefront. And the distance between these new two wavefronts is your uh, uh, radiation period. And this is 
essentially it's the uh, Doppler shifted uh, undulator period, and it's given by this expression here. It's not quite the, the equation I showed you before. We'll, we'll see how we get there in a second. So now to derive your central wavelength, you need to, uh, well, you need to know what your transverse velocity is, right? This is a, just a trivial uh, uh, rearrangement of the expression for gamma. These two, uh, one over gamma square and beta square are very small numbers, so you just take them out of your square root by uh, multiplying them by one over two. And now if you have a helical undulator, like I said, your transverse velocity is constant, so you have a k, k square over gamma square, and this is your final expression for your radiation wavelength. If you have a planar undulator, your transverse velocity is not constant, so you have a cosine square, you average it over one oscillation period, and you get this uh, expression that I showed you at the beginning. Now, what does an electron do uh, in an undulator? Well, you have a transverse oscillation, that's an accelerated motion, it will emit radiation. Like I said, uh, by almost by definition, your, uh, uh, the electric field slips ahead of the electrons by, by one uh, uh, radiation wavelength per oscillation period. And so the distance that the radiation uh, uh, the acquires with respect to the electrons is called the slippage length, and it's nothing but the number of oscillation periods, so the number of undulator periods, times uh, one radiation wavelength. So each electron emits a, a wave train with n u cycles, and u is the number of uh, periods in your undulator, and it's, these are very highly relativistic electrons, so they emit mostly in the forward direction. And as far as polarization goes, you get, you know, it's the same polarization as the, um, uh, uh, as the um, polarization of your transverse velocity. So you, you have linear polarization for a, a, a planar undulator and circular polarization for a helical undulator. The only twist here is that actually the polarization gets reversed uh, from the electron motion to the radiation because it's, uh, it's essentially a, a reflection of, the, of your undulator uh, polarization. Now, this is a visualization of one electron, what one electron does. And what one electron does is pretty boring. Like I said, it just emits, emits one, wave, one wave trend. It's more interesting to see when you have, uh, what happens when you have many electrons. So now we work our way up going to two electrons. Now, if you have two electrons that are uh, separated by more than a slippage length, then these two electrons don't talk to each other. Each, one, each electron is going to emit its own wave, wave train and uh, they're just gonna be uh, uh, not aware of each other. Now, if the two electrons are within a slippage length, then you, well, you have one region where they don't overlap, sorry, two regions where they don't overlap, and then there's this region where they do overlap, and now the field is either higher or lower depending on the relative phase of the electrons, of course, right? So you can have constructive interference or destructive interference depending on the phase. Now, of course, in an in electron beam, you have uh, billions, well, millions or billions of electrons, so that this picture doesn't quite apply to anything that you'll see in reality. Uh, in reality, you have something like this. You have a ton of electrons. Well, not, not a ton. You have a lot of electrons. And, uh, well, each one of them is, is going to emit one wave train. And in, uh, this is what happens, for example, in a synchrotron light source. You have a lot of electrons, and they're randomly distributed. So they don't, uh, they're not going to interfere constructively. Um, uh, so what happens is, uh, if you want to calculate the radiation power, well, you have to calculate the sum squared of a, number, of a large number of uh, sinusoid, uh, sinusoidal waves that have a random phase. Right? This is a pretty easy calculation because what you have is uh, 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 all the individual contribution of each electron, so the square of the field of each electron, and then you have all the cross terms. And, and now this phase is randomly distributed, so all the cross terms uh, uh, add up to zero on average, so your total radiation power is, uh, is n times uh, e zero squared. And now, I can't emphasize this enough. N is not the number of particles in the bunch. It's the number of particles in a slippage length, right? Like I said before, the two particles are more than a slippage length away. They don't talk to each other. So the two, the two waves cannot, can't add up. So N is only, like I said, only the, numbers in a wave, the number of particles in a wave train contributes to emission. And now my favorite moment, I get to use the card. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about this. What is the coherence length of the radiation emitted in this, in this situation? You have a number, a lot of electrons that are distributed over many wavelengths, randomly distributed. So what's the coherence length? The length of the beam, the slippage length, the length of the undulator, or one wavelength? Have a few minutes to think about it.
I know, yeah, <laughs> giving them extra time for the first question. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> you already knew it. Okay, maybe one minute is enough. Yeah. Let me see some colors. Let's see, I see a lot of yellow. Mostly yellow, I see some blue. Okay, yellow is indeed the correct answer. And uh, uh, it's pretty easy to understand c conceptually. The uh, radiation is, tra is propagating across the electron beam longitudinally. So the, the radiation field introduces uh, uh, correlation between uh, uh, posi different positions, right? So the electro, you know, when you sum over, over many electrons, the, the end result is that as long as, you, as you're within a slippage length, your, uh, the phase of your field will be coherent. Now, a more relevant case to FELs is that of uh, a micro bunched beam. Now, uh, this is uh, unfortunate. In our field, uh, we call coherent something that isn't necessarily coherent. So in this case, it is coherent. But what's, what's called coherent in, uh, in uh, accelerator physics is emission from micro bunch electrons. So whenever your uh, uh, fields add up coherently over whatever short distance, even if it's only one or two wavelengths, that's called coherent emission. Uh, I know that's not what laser physicists like to call uh, coherent, coherent, but uh, well, just bear, bear with, uh, with our nomenclature. Well, so we start with the easy case, which is fully coherent. So you have a num uh, all the electrons now are not randomly distributed, but they're bunched up in small micro bunches, and the distance between the bunches is uh, exactly one radiation wavelength, right? Now, uh, calculating the power in this case is a lot easier, and not that it was very hard before, but uh, essentially now you're summing up a, a bunch of sinusoids that all have the same phase, and now when you square them, you just get n squared times uh, e zero squared over two, right? And you can see how this, now you're gaining a factor n over what, uh, what you were doing with spontaneous radiation. So that's the 10 orders of minus that Magdan was talking about. And again, n is not the number of particles in the bunch, it's the number of particles in a wave train. And it's exactly for the same reason. These are not infinitely long sinusoids, they're only a slippage length long. So only the particles within a slippage length will, contribu will contribute to the emission. And this is important. Uh, you know, when, when you're running an experiment in LCLS and you ask to double the charge, what they'll give you is, is they'll give you a bunch that's twice as long. So the, the power will not go, will not go up like, uh, uh, will not go up by a factor of four, you only get twice the uh, pulse energy. However, this is a huge number, and the number of particles in a slippage length for an X-ray FEL is uh, on the order of 10 to the seven. So it is a huge gain going from uh, incoherent to coherent emission. Now, for this situation, what is the coherent length, coherence length? I'm going to give you 30 seconds because I suspect you already know the answer. Okay, let me see some colors. Okay, so there's some more variety this time. Um, well, actually in this case, it's the length of the electron beam. And this is because, uh, well, it doesn't matter that the, the electrons don't talk to each other as long as their phase is uh, already coherent, right? So. Uh, Right, there's two ways to establish coherence, and one is letting radiation propagate, and the other way is just to make sure your electrons are nicely, nicely arranged in a, in a periodic way, then you'll get coherence over whatever length you, uh, you want. And now, uh, let's see, yes, so that's what I just said. This is a more interesting case, uh, and uh, it's somewhat relevant to uh, SASE FELs, although that's, uh, there's another twist there, but so imagine now you have your electrons, they're, they're perfectly bunched, 
individually. So each micro bunch is nice and short and, uh, and it's a wavelength away from their neighbors, except every once in a while, every LMB, we'll call it length of the micro bunching, you get a phase jump, right? So you, hear, you see here going from blue to yellow, you get a phase jump. From, red, from yellow to red, you get a phase jump. And from red to blue, you get another phase jump, right? What is, um, what is the coherence length in this case? It's a little harder. I'll give you a minute. Oh, just the longest of the two means the longest between the coherence length of the microbunching and the slippage length. Okay, it's been about a minute. Let's see. Okay, I see a lot of yellow, a lot of green. Okay, this, this is good. So diversity of views is always good. Uh, it's the longest of the two. And uh, there's an easy way to see this. Um, the easy way is to think of your radiation field as a convolution between your charge distribution and the single particle field, right? So when you convolve two things of different lengths, the end result is always something on the, on, on, with a length that's on the order of the longest of the two. And for those of you who like to think in the frequency domain, it's exactly the same reasoning, except now it's the opposite. You have the product of uh, your, the spectrum of the microbunching times the spectrum of the single particle emission. And uh, now the product of the two is going to have a width that's, pretty much, that's uh, given by the shortest, uh, by the narrowest width of the two. Which means that which and then the width is the inverse of either your coherence length or your single particle uh, slippage length, right? So, uh, whichever way you, uh, you oh sorry, this is a product. This is not a convolution. But whichever way you look at it, you get the same answer. The two adding quadrature, so the uh, the longest of the two wins. Now, I've showed you a few simplified cases. In, in general, you never have a, a you know a clean cut situation like that. Microbunching is never 100% even for one uh, uh, slice of your electron beam. So normally what you do is you define something called a bunching factor. And it's uh, given by the sum of the phase terms of each electron divided by the number of electrons in the whole beam. In this case, you're, uh, just, you're, you can use the whole beam. And now this, by definition, is uh, uh, it's something that's smaller or equal than one. And it's zero when your electrons are perfectly uniformly distributed. So your, your Fourier component at, uh, at your wavelength is zero. It's one, like I said before, it's one when the electrons are perfectly bunched, uh, because now all, uh, all these phase terms are going to be the same. And it's you know, between zero and one when your electrons have some degree of uh, modulation, but they're not fully, fully modulated. So what I've been trying to tell you uh, until now, without deriving an equation, is that essentially, Whenever you have microbunching, microbunching causes the emission of coherent radiation in an undulator, in any ra radiation uh, uh, um, process you can think of. But in this case, we're interested in undulator radiation, right? So if you, look, if, you, if you go through what the notes will give you, you'll see the derivation of this wave equation. And essentially, what you're, what you're doing here is you're, you're neglecting diffraction. And we do this because we're interested in the X-ray FEL, so uh, very little diffraction. And then you do something called a slowly varying uh, envelope uh, approximation. Essentially, you assume that your radiation is given by an oscillating term times a, slow, a, a very slowly a, a narrow bandwidth envelope. And this essentially is telling us that our signal has a narrow bandwidth. And it's a justified assumption uh, for uh, any free electron laser. Uh, and this is because you're going through a lot of uh, undulator periods. So the single particle emission is going to be naturally very narrow, uh, narrow bandwidth. And so this equation, well, you have the derivative of your field times the dephasing term that's due, due to detuning. And detuning is the difference between the wavelength 
of your micro sorry, the frequency of your microbunching and the frequency and the resonant frequency of the undulator. So if the two are perfectly resonant, then you just have that the radiation field grows linearly with the with Z when you have microbunching. If the two are not perfectly resonant, so you have a slight uh, detuning, then what happens is, well, you, your, your, your uh, radiation is slightly defaced, and so it doesn't grow as fast as if it, if it, as if it was perfectly resonant. And so this is the first of your uh, FEL equations. So what we learned so far, uh, whenever you have microbunching, you have coherent radiation that goes like the square of your bunching factor. Right? Now the big question is how you generate microbunching. And by the way, this, is not, this was not discovered by Pellegrini or by Medi. This has been known forever, that if you microbunch uh, 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 an electron bunch, you get a lot of radiation. The problem is it's not easy to do because your, you know, your electrons come out of some cathode, a photocathode or a thermionic cathode, and they come out uh, at random times. So there's no way uh, to, just, you know, to just generate out of a, a particle accelerator, there's no way to generate electrons that are microbunched micro at this fine scale. You can microbunch them at terahertz uh, if, you you know, if you modulate your, the laser that generates the electrons, but nothing, you, can, you can't get nowhere close to, to X-ray microbunching unless uh, uh, you do something clever, and that's why it took us 40 years to develop the X-ray FEL. So, well, the basic idea is that to generate microbunching, you need first a velocity modulation in your uh, particle beam. And it's uh, easy to see. If you, look, if you have your particles distributed this way, this is, this is your longitudinal phase space. This is uh, your longitudinal velocity here, and the or horizontal axis is Z. You have your particles that have a sinusoidal velocity modulation. Well, what happens is that now, the particles that have a positive velocity will uh, uh, travel forward. The ones with negative velocity will you know, travel a little slower. They're all, by the way, these, these are all particles that are traveling very fast in this direction. So this is small a small modulation over the uh, velocity of the electron beam. Well, what happens is, well, like I said, higher velocity, uh, lower velocity, they will meet around these zero crossings. And so if you just let a velocity modulation, uh, uh, a beam with a velocity modulation drift, you let it drift for a while, you end up uh, with uh, this situation where you have, now you have particles that are bunched around, uh, around this uh, uh, zero crossing of your modulation. Right? Now, like I promised you, uh, dispersive motion in an undulator is a key ingredient for the FEL to work. Longitudinal motion in an undulator is dominated by, this, by longitudinal dispersion, which means uh, Particles with higher energy travel faster because they go on a, on a smaller oscillation. They all, they all travel very close to the speed of light. So if you give them a bigger transverse kick, they will lag uh, behind more than if you give them a smaller transverse kick. And so uh, higher energy uh, translates to a higher uh, uh, longitudinal motion, faster longitudinal motion. And so to make uh, velocity modulation uh, in your FEL, what you need is an energy modulation, right? And this leads us to our second uh, uh, FEL equation. And uh, what you just, we define eta as the relative energy difference of one electron with respect to the average uh, um, energy in your electron beam. And what you see, if you uh, go through two or three lines of derivation, is that your, the uh, time derivative of your uh, bunching factor is given by some constant time this times this quantity here, which is you can recognize as the energy modulation. It's the sum of the energy. Um, deviation of each electron times its uh, phase factor. And now your, uh, uh, um, you, you get your second FEL equation, it tells you have, if you have an energy modulation that makes the bunching factor grow. Now, this uh, uh, leads us to our last question, is how do you make an energy modulation in, uh, in your electron beam? And this is gonna look silly, but I really like this slide. This is, uh, uh, this is made by Daniel Ratner for a, a talk he gave five years ago. And you, you have to think of, uh, you know, two cars, right? Of course, one car is going to be your photons and your car is going to be your electrons. But, you know, this is, uh, you know, in the Silicon Valley here, this is going to be a fancy uh, Tesla. And this, you know, I'm Italian, this is going to be a Fiat 500. And it's, pretty, it's a pretty slow car. Uh, in addition to not being nearly as fancy as your, as your Tesla, your uh, uh, 500 has the extra burden of traveling on a curvy road, right? Whereas your Tesla is going straight on a highway. So if you have one of each, well, what happens is your poor Tesla, you know, there's nothing, nothing your Italian driver, sorry, your poor Cinquecento, there's nothing your Italian driver can do about it. It's going to see the Tesla get, get ahead of him at every, at every turn. 
Now, when it comes to electron uh, light interaction, the situation is a little different. Now you have uh, one Cinquecento, but you have a train of Tesla, right? And every time your Cinquecento turns a corner, it sees a new, a new Tesla just like the one it saw at the previous turn, right? So now, now your Italian driver is feeling good about himself. He thinks he's keeping up with the, with the Tesla. And this is exactly what happens in your, uh, in your undulator, is that um, the radiation slips ahead by one wavelength per oscillation period, right? Which means, trivially, every half oscillation period, the radiation goes ahead by half a wavelength, right? So every half oscillation period, your electrons change the sign of, of the transverse velocity, right? And when that happens, the radiation has gone ahead by half a wavelength. So they see every time the uh, velocity changes sign, the radiation, also, the radiation field also has a change sign, right? So the product of the two also has, always have the same sign. And what you do, what, what that does, is it gives you a, a net energy exchange between the electrons and the radiation, right? The rate of electron energy change is given trivially by this uh, expression here, V is the velocity of your electrons. And so your electrons are resonant with the radiation. Each electron is going to either exchange, either give energy to the field or take energy from the field depending on the phase of the electron. Now in an FEL, you have a lot of electrons you have, uh, you have, sorry, you have a lot of wavelengths in an electron beam. So what that does is it, crea it creates a smooth uh, energy modulation in, uh, in your electron bunch. And just a, a small uh, uh, digression here. This is true of every radiation process. This is not, the undulator is nothing special uh, from this point of view. If you look, this is a very general uh, equation. There's a very nice derivation from Stupakov in this uh, review paper. The energy change of, an, uh, of a charged particle uh, in an electric, in a, an electromagnetic field is given by this expression. This is just the losses to spontaneous radiation, spontaneous, spontaneous radiation, and E rad is the field of, generated by the particle in the, in the far field. And now you have this term that is the equivalent of uh, stimulated emission uh, or uh, absorption in, uh, in classical electrodynamics, and it's given by the scalar product of your, the radiation field of your, of your particle in the far field times whatever external field you have in, um, in uh, interacting with, the, with your particles. Which means uh, to, emit, to exchange energy with an external wave, that wave has to be coupled to your electrons, and the way you couple a wave to your electrons is that that wave has to be some uh, mode that the electron can emit, right? There has to be overlap between the radiation field of your electron and the wave you're trying to exchange energy with. Now, back to our FEL. I think now we have all the ingredients uh, uh, you need to understand FEL physics. And so the first ingredient is resonant interaction. Your electrons uh, are exchanging energy continuously with the, uh, uh, with, the, with the radiation field, either with a positive or negative sign. That leads to an energy modulation. Now, dispersion in your undulator turns their energy modulation into a density modulation, right? So you go from this situation here where you just have energy modulation and, uh, and just a smooth density to this situation here where you have microbunching. The microbunching uh, causes the emission of coherent radiation, and now your coherent radiation feeds back into your resonant interaction. This process goes unstable, as you can see a nice uh, 3D simulation of the process here. You see this is your uh, uh, average power. It starts from very low. This is logarithmic scale and then it reaches a, a saturation point. Of course, I, I you know, talked about this energy modulation to density modulation process as a two-step process. In practice, this happens uh, uh, continuously over this exponential growth. It's not just you go from zero microbunching to half microbunching, in one, uh, 2.5 microbunching in one step. What happens is more like, like this. Uh, these are your electrons. This is uh, Y, and this is your uh, uh, longitudinal position. You start from very little microbunching, you can hardly see it, and then uh, slowly but surely you get to a fully microbunched beam. Now, another quick digression. I've given you the elevator speech on how an FEL works. And I tell you, well, you have microbunching, uh, so you have a field that creates an energy modulation, which creates microbunching, which creates more field. Right? Now, this interplay from uh, field to energy modulation to bunching back to field is not, uh, it doesn't only happen in FEL, it happens in any, uh, every time you have a, a, an ensemble of charged particles in some uh, uh, electric field, right? So those of you who are familiar with uh, plasma physics will recognize the same pattern that you use to describe uh, a plasma oscillation, except now it doesn't go unstable, right? So it's not the fact that you have interplay between field energy modulation and microbunching that makes 
the system go unstable because the obvious example, like I said, is the plasma oscillation where you have the bunching, which generates a, a strong space charge field, which makes an energy modulation, which now subtracts from the bunch, bunching you had at the beginning, right? It really, whether, whether your process of going from field to modulation to bunching back to field goes unstable or not, depends on the interaction uh, you're looking at. And so, you know, in space surge interaction, there's, there's nothing you can do unless you have some, some weird uh, multi-stream uh, instability. The, the, the interaction does not go unstable. Well, the radiation field, uh, it, in the case of the FEL, it does, and it's because the space surge field counteracts existing bunching because the electrons, they tend to repel each other through Coulomb, Coulomb fields, whereas the radiation field doesn't. The radiation field works in favor of the existing bunching. And, after, you know, this is... There's nothing you can do about it. This is just uh, in the field equation. And the, you know, the conclusion is just nature has been very generous with, uh, with us and, and it makes this uh, instability happen. So what I've uh, explained so far is, is uh, essentially the linear one-dimensional model of FELs, where we have ne neglected the fraction, we have assumed a small signal. So uh, what we talked about so far only applies to the small signal uh, case, so where your bunching factor is still is, is smaller than significantly smaller than one. And we have assumed a narrow bandwidth signal, so the slowly varying envelope. And also, this is a simplified model. We assume no temp the beam has a zero temperature. It's perfectly, you start with a beam where all the electrons have the same energy. They have the zero transverse velocity, and um, everything is nice and ideal. And like, uh, like I said, uh, each step of this uh, uh, process is described by its own equation. This is the field equation. This is the uh, energy modulation equation. So your energy modulation grows proportionally to the existing uh, uh, field. Uh, then the bunching factor uh, uh, grows, uh, you know, grows as a function of your energy modulation. So you, and like we said, energy modulation creates bunching factor. And then you have your wave equation that says, well, you have some bunching factor. Now it's going to make some radiation field, right? Now. This is a linear uh, system of equation. It's really easy to solve. And um, let's look at the equilibrium of this uh, system. And it's, it's pretty trivial, right? If uh, all the quantities that we talked about are zero, so if you have no micro-bunching, no initial field, and, no, and your beam is perfectly monoenergetic, so you have no energy modulation, then nothing happens, right? Because uh, in the idealized case where you have zero bunching, there's no radiation. There's no way you can generate energy modulation. There's no, you, no way you can make uh, bunching. So this is a nice uh, equilibrium uh, uh, condition. It's not very interesting. So if it, this was ever uh, realized in, in nature, then uh, I would probably be doing a different job. But uh, luckily, that uh, equilibrium is, is unstable. And you can stab, study the, the stability of the system. Well, it's, you, we start with the simplest case of no detuning, so that makes the equation look even prettier. And now you assume that your field, your bunching factor, and your energy modulation, they all go uh, like, uh, they all have this exponential uh, uh, dependence on z. Z is the position of your, along your undulator. Uh, it's essentially, z is a proxy for, uh, for time. And uh, so k Wiggler is known to y uh, is known. So the only unknown here is alpha. So if you plug this expression in your field equations, uh, these three equations, uh, you, you get uh, non-trivial solutions only if uh, this condition is verified. Alpha cubed is equals rho cubed. And rho is the so-called uh, Pierce parameter. And I'll show you in the next few slides. It's, it's in, in the simple one-dimensional model, it defines all the properties of, of the free electron laser. Right? And uh, rho is given by this expression. This is rho for a helical undulator. It, it looks prettier. It's very similar for a planar undulator. You just have a slightly different expression. Um, so K is not exactly K, you just have to, you have to modify it slightly, but it, it, you know, it doesn't change the physics. And uh, it's essentially K times the uh, plasma frequency of the electron beam, which goes like 1 over gamma cubed, over the undulator period, or, or undulator frequency, and uh, you have a factor 4. It's just how Claudio and Bonifacio decided to normalize this. And uh, everything to the, to the 2 thirds. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with beam physics, uh, you will know that the plasma frequency of an electron beam is very small. The plasma fre frequency of a relativistic electron beam, especially the ones we use at LCLS, is tens of meters, hundreds of meters, right? And now you're, you're sorry, that's the plasma period. The undulator period is very short, so a few centimeters, and K is of order one. So just by, just by 
looking at this, you can tell that rho is a small number. Right? Now, alpha cube equals rho cube is our dispersion equation of the FEL. It has three roots. And uh, well, there's a stable root that just uh, gives you an oscillation. It has a, sorry, there's an oscillatory root, a stable root, so an exponentially decay, uh, decaying uh, mode. And luckily, you have this uh, third mode, which is uh, unstable. When you plug it into your uh, exponent, it gives you exponential growth uh, of your field. OK, so back to the row parameter. Um, Going, I'm explaining the row parameter in excruciating detail because, like I said, it's the most important parameter in the field physics. It goes like, uh, so the um, plasma frequency goes like uh, density to, to the one half, right? So this goes, this row, row parameter goes like the density, the electron density to the one third, right? This is an obvious interpretation. The denser, the higher the density of your beam, the faster your gain, right? And for those of you who are plasma physics enthusiasts like uh, myself, this is a scaling typical of all three wave uh, instabilities. This is uh, uh, the FEL equations actually are, if, for, the, for those of you who are familiar with uh, plasma instabilities, they're actually, they look, they're gonna look very familiar if you, if you, if you, if you look at them uh, in detail. Now, uh, the depend, it, depend, it goes like, rho goes like one over gamma, right? Which means, that uh, at higher energy, you have a smaller growth rate. And that tells you why the LCLS undulator is 120 meters long. Because even though you, our beam is really bright, uh, you still have this 1 over gamma, which is gamma is 10 to the 4 or more, that you know, makes the, the, gain, the gain slower. And this has an obvious interpretation. The transverse velocity is k over gamma. right? So the higher your energy, the smaller your transverse velocity. So the smaller the coupling of the electrons to the radiation field. And last, you have a k to the 2 thirds. And again, this is the same argument I just made. k uh, goes into your uh, transverse velocity. So it's essentially a measurement of the coupling between the electrons and the field. So a bigger k gives you uh, a higher gain. And like I said, this is a small number, right? So for a, a typical X-ray FELs, based on current technology, we haven't found uh, any amazing way of uh, having beams that are 100 times brighter than they are now. So with the beam brightness we have now, rho is typically 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4, depending on the specific energy you're working at. <clears throat> now, the gain length. Uh, you're gonna, if you go into the FEL lit literature, you're going to see the gain length defined in many different ways, which can be a little frustrating. But there are only two ways that make sense to me. And one is what the theory is called the gain length, which is 1 over 2k Wiggler rho. Right? And uh, the theorists like to use this one because it makes the equations look very pretty. It makes all the square roots of two pi's, all the, uh, you know, all the factors two, all the factors pi, and your equations go away. Just, you only have ones and i's. Uh, now, for an experimentalist, this is not a very useful uh, definition. So experimentalists call gain length this number here. And uh, they, call, they define it this way because this is what you measure. The, when you define your gain length like this, the radiation power grows like e to the z over lg, right? And since power is what uh, you measure in your, uh, in your experiments, then that's what uh, experimentalists uh, like to use. Now, it's 1020, and we still, I still have more slides, don't, don't worry. But uh, if, 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 if I, you know, I'll be very happy if a few months from now you'll remember what we talked about so far, because this is the basis of uh, FEL physics. And uh, really, now you can look at, your, at this uh, plot from the famous uh, uh, LCLS first lasing paper, and you understand what's going on, right? You start from a small signal, you trigger the FEL instability, and you, your power goes up all the way to your saturation power, where your beam is uh, fully microbunched. And I think this is a great time to take a five-minute break. Uh, so we, we are going to make the slides available. I will also make uh, uh, notes with all the derivations uh, available. So uh, I don't expect you to you know, follow the details of every uh, equation. I'm hoping I can get the physics across. And then when, you know, in the loneliness of your uh, uh, office, you can, uh, you can go through all the equations and, uh, and derive them yourself. OK. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the linear model. 
uh, the linear model uh, assumes that uh, you're far from saturation, so you have a small micro-bunching, small energy modulation, and a field much smaller than the saturation value, which we haven't defined. Right? Uh, the beauty of the linear model, of course, it, it results in linear equations that have a very easy exponential solution. Right? Now, uh, it's, you know, knowing what this number is, the saturation power of the free electron laser is, uh, is important. And uh, of course, the um, linear model, in theory, uh, you shouldn't use the linear model to mm, uh, derive properties of uh, your system at saturation. And this is true for the FEL and for every instability. However, uh, if you're lazy like me, you can still extract some information about the saturation uh, properties from the linear model. And uh, <clears throat> So here's the idea. During the exponential growth, uh, you have this relationship between the, your field and your uh, microbunching, right? So if you plug in your exponential solution uh, and do some uh, uh, algebra, what you get is that the radiation power at any mo uh, given moment during the exponential growth is rho times the beam power times the bunching factor square, right? And this is strictly true only during the exponential growth. However, uh, when is the FEL going to saturate? Okay, unfortunately, I didn't, I sh maybe I should have made color-coded questions for, for this one, but uh, anyone has a guess of when the, F the FEL, uh, of course, I wrote it there, so never mind. <laughs> of course, the FEL saturates when the bunching factor is equal to one, because the bunching factor, the way it's defined, is uh, smaller than one or equal to one when the electrons are fully bunched, so your instability is, is going to make the FEL not only the field uh, grow, but also the micro-bunching and the energy modulation uh, grow uh, exponentially, and uh, we don't know what the saturation value of the field is, we don't know what the saturation value of the energy modulation is, but we know for sure that the bunching factor cannot be bigger than one. And so we arbitrarily say, okay, our saturation point is when the bunching factor is close to one, which is uh, true enough, right? This is a, a model that spans many orders of magnitude. You start from noise, a few kilowatts to many gigawatts, right? So if you get your answer right to within 30%, I think that's uh, uh, quite an accomplishment. And, uh, you know, you can run uh, some nonlinear simulation and you'll get exactly this answer that uh, within 30%, not exactly, you'll get this answer within 30% that the saturation power of the free electron laser is rho times the beam power. So like I told you, rho is a very important uh, quantity, it defines everything about your uh, one-dimensional FEL. And in this case, it defines the extraction efficiency of the free electron laser. And the beam power is uh, essentially the uh, amount of energy that uh, tr flows, you know, at a, given position with, uh, with the electron beam, right? So it's the, an easy way to calculate it is the energy in electron volts times the uh, peak current, right? Uh, okay, now uh, I want you to call me a, a liar or uh, uh, spend a few times thinking why I didn't lie to you. Because I promised you that the coherent radiation goes like the square of the number of particles, didn't I? Uh, however, uh, rho goes like the current to the one-third, and uh, beam power go is proportional to the current. So your saturation power now goes like the number of particles per unit, le unit length time, time, uh, to the four-thirds, right? And uh, now is the time for a fancy color-coded question. Why is that? So answer one, I'm a liar. It's possible. Uh, Yellow, the FEL saturation is fundamentally different from the simple microbunch beam we analyzed before. That was a pretty simplified model. Maybe it doesn't apply to this, uh, to our FEL saturation. Green is uh, the slip slippage length depends on the current. Blue, some other mysterious reason. Uh, take your time. <laughs> That's fair. Is anyone ready to answer? Huh? Is there only one right answer? Well, there's two possible. Uh, <laughs> I mean, regardless of whether this is true or not, this could, you know, you have no proof that. <laughs> but, uh, okay, what's, what's your answer? Okay, I see, good. I see a lot of uh, yellow. That's not good. Uh, I, see a, I see some green, <laughs> green is good. 
the answer is that slippage depends on current. And I, it, it, this is not very intuitive, and I'll explain why. Uh, so what matters is the number of particles in a slippage length, right? This is we talked about before. Uh, now, the particles per unit length, uh, trivially, they go like the uh, current. However, the slippage length, it depends, the slippage length at saturation depends on how long it took you to get to saturation, right? So it depends on uh, how, how short or long your gain length is, right? And now the gain length goes like uh, the current to the one third, right? So uh, yes, if you increase the current, you get more particles per unit length, but you also get less slippage overall, right? So now you're, uh, you have i divided by i to the one third, and then when you make the square, it's the number of particles squared in a slippage length goes like the current to the four thirds, right? And I make a point of spending several mi precious minutes on this because it, it's something pretty infuriating uh, for an FEL physicist. You read it in books, and uh, it's wrong. So uh, some people say, oh, it's because the FEL is not truly super radiant. Super radiant means uh, radiation goes like n squared. It's not so truly super radiant. It's, it's some system, some cooperative emission between spontaneous and uh, super radiant. Not true. The FEL saturation is perfectly super radiant. The beam is almost fully microbunched. The thing, the, the, the reason for this fourth third is, like I said, it won't matter is the number of particles in a slippage length. It's not the number of particles in your beam. Okay, so I did not lie. Um, okay, now, uh, again, this will all be in the notes, but uh, the reason why I want to show you this is, well, first of all, this is the, the, people call this universal scaling, and like I told you, right, when you normalize everything properly, you can make the equations look very pretty. So now here you have no dimensional uh, uh, constants anymore. And the idea is we take the FEL equations I showed you before, we normalize everything to the saturation value, right? Uh, we don't have time to go through this, but the saturation value of the energy modulation is rho, right? So rho is not only the extraction efficiency, it's also the energy spread that you induce in your electron beam at saturation. And you normalize your uh, field to the saturation value, and now you use the pretty, the theorist uh, definition of gain length, and you get these nice equations. And the reason why I show, I'm showing you this is that the only thing we haven't, uh, uh, you know, we haven't assigned its own letter is this quantity here, and it's your uh, detuning, so delta k, so k minus the resonance, so radiation frequency minus the resonant frequency divided by the resonant frequency, right? Divided by two rho, right? Now if you don't have to do any math, so you just have to look at this and you understand that the uh, bandwidth of the free electron laser is of order rho. Right? Because whatever is going to make these equations look pretty is going to also to, going to give you the, the scale uh, of the quantities involved. Right? So your saturation power makes the equations look pretty because it's, uh, it's the scale, it's a natural scale of your free electron laser. Right? So um, we will uh, uh, normalize everything and call now our, our small uh, lowercase delta is big delta over two rho, and that's that's what goes into the equations. And uh, like I said, just just looking at it, that's, that tells you rho is, is your, more or less your bandwidth. And now you can, uh, you know, again, make your old uh, uh, assumption that everything goes exponentially and you get the well-known, uh, the famous cubic equation of the free electron laser. This, tell, this gives you the growth rate, right? This is the imaginary part of lambda, lambda is your growth rate as a function of uh, your normalized detuning, right? You have uh, the instability uh, has a cutoff at low, uh, a negative de uh, uh, detunings and it, it dies off very slowly at positive uh, detuning. Now, uh, back to the physics, uh, back to the dimensional uh, equations, because they, they make more sense. Uh, you have three coupled equations, right? And you have a system that has an unstable equilibrium. And uh, it, what this tells you is that any initial non-zero value of any of these three variables is going to trigger the instability, right? And this, go, this you know, leads us to the different types of free electron lasers you can find. Now, uh, conceptually, not experimentally, but conceptually, the easiest way uh, uh, to understand, to trigger the instability is to start it with an external field, right? And that's what we call a seeded uh, free electron laser. It's what the people in, in Trieste do. And uh, you, you have an initial narrow bandwidth laser, and uh, uh, the beauty of the seeded free electron laser is like what we, is what we said at the beginning. It creates particles that are micro-bunched in a coherent way all across the beam, so now your coherence length extends all the way to the coherence length of your bunch or of your laser, whichever, uh, whichever is shorter. 
Uh, however, uh, the, the way to trigger the FEL that's conceptually harder but experimentally easier is uh, shot noise. Now, uh, shot noise is pretty interesting for, you know, if you're into, into beam physics, plasma physics, pretty interesting theoretical concept. And there's a, uh, Avi Gover, uh, the guy who wrote this uh, paper, he had, a, he had a very interesting story about shot noise and uh, he took this uh, uh, statistical physics class and the teacher stopped halfway through the class and he gave half the class a dice uh, and he asked them to throw it a hundred times and write down the answer and gave the other half of the class a piece of paper and just told them just pretend you're throwing a uh, dice and, and make the uh, and make up the answer right and then you, you know if you take the answer you, he wouldn't know who was who but if you take one uh, piece of paper with all the answers you can tell which one was a real dice and which one was it because you know, the students that were trying to mimic the dice, they were trying to make it as smooth as possible, right? So they'd have a one, a two, a six, a five, but you rarely would see a five, 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 five sequence, right? Because, yeah, that's, an, uh, that's not a very, uh, there's not a very high probability of that happening, but it still happens nonetheless. And uh, the same thing happens with electron beams. On average, your electron beam has no bunching, it's nice and smooth, but since the distribution of the electrons is random, st over, uh, you know, over your billion uh, uh, electrons, statistically, you're going to have a few that are a little closer to each other than, uh, than others, right? And those make little spikes of, uh, of micro-bunching, right? That's, that's what we call uh, shot noise. That's what causes noise in your instruments, by the way, also, except in that case you also have velocity noise, which in this case is pretty small. But it, it's a pretty general concept. And uh, it's pretty easy to describe mathematically, because now you, we know our bunching factor is this sum of, uh, of phase terms, right? And if we assume that all the phases are random, the average bunching factor is zero, right? However, if you compute the square, uh, well, it's, it's the same calculation we did at the beginning with spontaneous radiation, right? You get all the cross terms are zero, but then you get uh, the terms for n equal m, they're non-zero. And now your, uh, your RMS bunching factor is one over, well, the bunching factor, the bunching power from noise is one over n. And now n is the number of particles in the whole electron beam. It's, you can define it that way. Then. <clears throat> so, Okay, this is nice and beautiful. What does uh, your shot noise look, look like in reality, in the frequency domain, right? And you can, you know, open MATLAB or Mathematica, right? And you can do this by yourself. You can, if you make a distribution, if you distrib distribute uh, uh, particles over longitudinally randomly, uh, and you take the, uh, you make the, your micro spectrum, you calculate your micro spectrum numerically, well, what you see is that, uh, as you increase the length of your distribution, of your particle distribution, you get, so you get spikes, uh, you get micro spikes in your spectrum, right? And the width of these spikes gets narrower and narrower the longer your uh, electron distribution is in time. And uh, you can think of it trivially as, you know, nothing can change in the spectrum uh, on a scale that's faster than one over the length of your, of your beam. Uh, or, you, or you can be a little more uh, uh, rigorous, and there's a very nice derivation of this in uh, Saldin's book. Actually, it's also in my notes, but it is, I want to credit Saldin, he, he made this uh, it's a pretty beautiful derivation. Uh, that if you calculate the spectral uh, uh, autocorrelation function of, uh, of your bunching function, as a function of frequency, uh, well, what it is is uh, essentially the Fourier transform of your uh, zeroth order charge distribution, so the smooth charge distribution. You take the Fourier transform of that, and its value of k minus k prime is the correlation function of the microbunching at two frequencies k, k prime, right? Which means now, if you go one over your uh, bunch length away, this function is close to zero, so you have no microbunching correlation, right? So these spikes are correlated over one over the, uh, um, the uh, bunch duration, right? And this is actually easy to see experimentally because so the, the Japanese have a, the, the SACLA, uh, our Japanese colleagues at SACLA, they have a very, uh, very nice uh, X-ray spectrometer, very high resolution. And so they did this it's pretty easy experiment. What they do is they start with an electron beam, electron bunch that's about 35 per second, right? And they compress it more and more. They make it shorter and shorter in time. And with the, when then you see your spikes go from very narrow to a little less narrow to pretty broad uh, uh, FEL spikes. And now, in general, uh, your, uh, uh, so this is called SASE. Your free electron noise is starting from no noise. It's called SASE. It stands for self-amplified spontaneous emission. And your spectrum, in general, looks like this. You have a, an, uh, an envelope, and uh, the width of the envelope is just the width of the amplification bandwidth of your system. So it's uh, on, of order rho. 
But uh, within this envelope, you have a, a, a number of uh, 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 narrow spikes that are uh, uh, lambda over the, um, that are one over the, the, the bunch length. <clears throat> okay, I forgot about this one. What is uh, the coherence length of Sazer? Uh, right, we've looked at it in the, in the frequency domain, right? Uh, what do you think happens in the, in the time domain? So the coherence length of size can be either the length of the electron bunch, the slippage length, the slippage length acquired in a gain length, or something else. Have a take your time. Okay, let's see some, some colors. Yeah, I see a lot of green, that's, that's good. Uh, indeed, it is the sleep, slippage length acquired in a gain length. And uh, well, it really depends on where you're looking, right? Because the coherence like, te technically increases like the distance, like time to the one half, or distance across your undulator to the one half. Um, but it is on the order of uh, uh, the slippage in a gain length. And that's uh, pretty easy to understand, right? The, you have your, uh, your electron here, uh, well, at any point, emitting photons, right? And uh, it's talking to the photons that were emitted before by the electrons behind, right? But if you go too far back, the, elect the photons emitted by, emitted by this guy, that they make it all the way here, they were emitted much earlier in your amplification process, right? So your, uh, it's true, your electrons are talking to photons emitted all the way back to the full slippage length, except only the ones that were emitted a gain length, uh, 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 you know, up to a gain length far, uh, uh, back in time are actually going to do something, right? Because if you go fa farther than the slippage in a gain length, you find photons that were emitted a long time ago when your bunching factor was, was much smaller, right? So technically, yes, you still have photons all the way across the slippage length, but only you know, this is called cooperation length, so slippage in a gain length are actually going to um, give you a strong enough correlation. And uh, <clears throat> now this number, uh, you know, we, we, did, we talked about it, right? Rho is about 10 to the minus 3, 5, 10 to the minus 4 for an FEL, right? So this is a pretty short uh, length. For example, at LCLS, it's about 1 or 2 femtoseconds at soft X-rays, and then it, it, it decreases to go to, as you go to higher energy, right, because the wavelength is shorter. And you get about 100 of a seconds at, at, you know, all the way at uh, about 10 kVs. And by the way, this has uh, been, it's been measured in, uh, in the time domain also uh, in the x-rays, but the very first measurement of uh, SASA spikes was done uh, in a, uh, infrared uh, FEL at uh, Brookhaven. And you can see this nice, uh, you know, you can see that what I've been telling you is real. You see this nice, uh, uh, spikes that inc you know, increase as a function of time, uh, increase their length. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, it for the theory, but uh, I, s I have more slides on advanced FEL concepts. I just wanted to make sure I, I, got, all, I got through the FEL physics. And uh, some references, uh, well, the, you know, the two classic papers on these are uh, Bonifacio and Pellegrini. This is from 1984. Uh, technically, it's not the first paper to ever talk about the FEL instability. But it is the one paper that everybody understands because it's, uh, it's written very clearly. It's written, it, it, they were the first to derive this dim uh, dimensionless scaling, this universal scaling, right? So they're credited with uh, formalizing this business of high gain free electron lasers. And they were also the first ones to analyze uh, SASE to understand the uh, uh, spiking uh, in time and frequency domain and temporal fluctuations. So those are, those are pretty dense papers. 
Also, they're written in uh, Bonifacio's language, who likes to talk about super radiance in a way that I consider very improper. But uh, you know, if you can get uh, if you can get over that, it's, those are really good papers. Uh, now, uh, Claudio, with my help and Sven Reich's help, recently wrote uh, this uh, review of modern physics paper. It has a nice. Uh, uh, it goes through every single equation in, in pretty good detail, so it's, it's, uh, it's a good reference to have. Um, I wrote some notes that are uh, 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 targeted at uh, uh, you know, people who's, who are seeing this for the first time, and I'll make them available. Jirong Huang uh, from, uh, is uh, my boss. He also has really, really good notes, and I'll ask him if he wants to make them available uh, for you. So you're going to have plenty of resources to study this uh, uh, on your own. Now. Uh, you can you can go uh, through all the details you want in uh, in your office, but I you know I would like you to remember a few things a year from now, as I know you won't remember the definition of rho, but I'd, li I'd like you to remember a, a few basic concepts. One is the difference between spontaneous and uh, coherent or super radiant emission, right? Spontaneous goes like like n, coherent emission and spontaneous that happens when your electrons are randomly distributed. You have coherent emission when your electrons are uh, uh, microbunched. This one goes like n, and this goes like over n squared, like n squared. So it's a huge gain going from spontaneous to coherent, right? The FEL, the whole concept of the FEL, it goes from spontaneous to coherent, thanks to a collective instability, right? So you don't have to do any work. All you have to do is make an electron beam that's bright enough, and it's just the system is going to go unstable and give you uh, n squared uh, uh, power. Rho, uh, rho. I don't even remember the definition of rho off the top of my head. I have to be honest. So I don't expect you to remember that. But uh, it's good to remember the scaling and, uh, and what it does. So rho defines the gain length of the FEL. It defines the relative bandwidth of the FEL. It defines the extraction efficiency of the FEL. And it also defines the energy acceptance uh, of the FEL. We didn't go through this, but it's, uh, uh, it tells you how, bi how big your energy spread can be. It has to be smaller than rho. OK, and now. Uh, I have technically 10 more minutes, right? But I can take a little longer. All right. So I want to, this is going to be hopefully the more fun part of the lecture. I'll, I'll show you uh, some of the work, some of the R&D that's being done here at Slack and around the world on, uh, on free electron lasers. Because uh, I, was, you know, I was hoping I would get you an understanding of how an FEL works. Uh, but uh, of course, we understand now uh, how, you know, it's this. This uh, has been going on for 40 years. We have a pretty good understanding of FEL physics. Now, the, all the interest in the research is in the developing new capabilities. And the FEL is a very flexible machine. Just like a regular laser, you can do a lot of different things with it. You can't just do a SASE. And uh, there are a number of people uh, uh, here at LCLS and at RF facilities that do that. They just, what, what we do is try to, make, to devise new, new, new ways of using the FEL for uh, uh, specific scientific applications. Right? So, what an FEL does, if you leave it alone, it gives you high power, good transverse coherent, but poor longitudinal coherence, right? Of course, the users, um, you know, there's, there's mm, we don't complain about it. We're happy that the users want something different because it keeps us uh, uh, engaged. And uh, well, the users ask for, uh, also for a number of things, and uh, they always ask for more power. Uh, and unfortunately, there, aren't, there isn't a trivial way to get a lot of power. Uh, you can extract more power uh, after saturation. You don't get another 10 orders of magnitude. You can maybe get, get another order of magnitude if you're lucky. Um, <clears throat> but they, do, they want longitudinal coherence, and there are ways to make uh, an FEL longitudinal coherent at any wavelength. Um, they want to control the pulse duration, and they want multiple pulses. And now, uh, I could talk about all of these, and it will take me three hours, but I'll, I'll talk about the two uh, hottest topics right now. One is longitudinal coherence, so all the possible sitting techniques. And then I'll uh, briefly go through uh, multiple pulses, because that's something uh, users have been pretty excited about. So um, we talked about this, the seated FEL. That's the most trivial way to make your uh, uh, FEL fully coherent. And what you do is you have uh, some fancy laser. You inject it into your undulator, you time it to your electron beam, and now your laser is going to imprint its coherent properties on the electrons and give you a fully coherent or close to fully coherent uh, radiation pulse. Right? Uh, this is um, the um, pioneering paper from uh, Lambert. They did this using HAG in gas. Uh, I think they got down to uh, 40, uh, 40 EVs? I don't know. 
Actually, I'm not sure you should read the paper. Uh, however, um, oh, yeah, I have one of these. Uh, so I told you, uh, this is a, an interesting question. Uh, I told you that the SASE power goes like rho times the beam power times the bunching square, right? So I told you the FEL power goes like a rho times the beam power times the bunching square, right? And I told you that the uh, shot noise power is one over n, right? Now, when we're talking about uh, power, you know, uh, strictly speaking, in the time domain, uh, who is n? W what is n that's going to make this equation make sense? Uh, number of particles in the beam, particles in the slippage length. I had to put a silly one, uh, Avogadro's number, but uh, of course, it's some, or something else. So it's not green. Right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not green. I mean. <laughs> And this, just to make it extra clear, this is the power, the initial power that uh, your FEL has when you started with noise. The initial value that the instability starts from. Right. So, okay, let's see some colors. I hope. Good, I see a lot of yellow. Yes, uh, it's the particles in a slippage length, right? Uh, yeah, you're trying to see it with an external laser that's going to make all the particles talk to each other. But noise is still a local effect, right? So only the particles that talk to each other through slippage uh, will contribute to noise. I, actually, technically, I didn't want to overcomplicate this. Technically, it's a, it's a number that is in between the particles in a slippage length and the particles in a cooperation length. It's somewhere in between also grows as a function of distance. But I'm glad that most people got the concept that when, whenever you're talking about noise, the number of particles in the beam is not very meaningful unless your beam is very short. Now, uh, external, so, this number here, uh, rho times the beam power times B noise squared, is uh, the power that you have to uh, overcome with your external seed, right? And typically, you can plug in numbers. It's, it's typically a few KVs, about uh, a few KVs at soft X-rays. It's maybe 10 KVs at hard X-rays. So it's, it's not a big number, but it's, it's not easy. It's, especially if you're using HAG sources in gas here, it's something you struggle with. Uh, so the main problem with external seeding is the availability of seed sources. And after all, if it was that easy, we wouldn't build FELs to begin with. Now, HAG in gas, uh, uh, David can correct me on this, but last time I checked, I think uh, you, uh, they can do tens of EVs, maybe 20 EVs? Depends how much you want. People are planning for 30 EVs. Huh? People are planning for 30 EVs. Uh, but uh, yeah, okay, microjoule pulse, uh, okay, exactly. So, okay, well, uh, any pulse energy that would, that would be useful to see the free electron laser, you can get two tens of, tens of EVs, okay, I think that's, maybe that's a, a good answer. Um, but, and we're still nowhere close to sitting directly at uh, hard X-ray energies for sure. Uh, we'll see where we are in 10 years. We're, uh, we're, we're expecting new results. Um, so there's one thing, the first thing you can do uh, to extend your seating range, it's called HEAG, uh, uh, -E, high gain harmonic uh, um, generation, high gain, sorry, H -E, yeah, high gain harmonic generation. And essentially what you're doing is you're up converting the FEL itself, right? So you, you start with some seed, in this case, this is from uh, the Fermi FEL in Trieste, right? They start with 260 nanometers because it's easy. It's the third harmonic of the TISAF. Uh, they go through a mod the first uh, uh, part of the FEL is called the modulator and it's tuned to your laser, right? And then they go through a chicane. And what the chicane does, if you have enough modulation, enough energy modulation from this uh, laser electron interaction, uh, the chicane is a dispersive, uh, dispersive uh, device. So what it, it makes, it makes the high energy particles slip ahead and low energy particles slip, back, slip backwards. And so they meet in the middle. That's the micro bunching process as I described it before, except now you're doing it in two steps. And uh, uh, you start from big energy modulation and you violently turn it, turn it into microbunching. And now you see this is a pretty narrow structure, right? So it contains harmonic of your initial modulation. The narrower these, uh, stri these vertical stripes here, the higher the wavelength, the shorter the wavelength you have in your microbunching, right? And now in your second modulator, you tune your FEL to whatever harmonic you can generate uh, this way. And, it, and, and now you're emitting coherently because you're starting from a coherent microbunching that triggers the instability in a coherent way across the beam and now you have a narrow band with FEL, right? Uh, 
And this is what they do at Fermi uh, in Trieste. They were very successful at this. I think in one stage they managed to, do, to go from 266 nanometers to, down to 32 nanometers. Uh, now, what's the problem with, uh, with this is uh, uh, the Vlasov equation, the Liouville theorem, right? The density in phase space is uh, preserved uh, uh, in the absence of collisions and uh, other you know, non-Hamiltonian uh, shenanigans. But, uh, so what this means is that uh, the width of your vertical stripe right, is essentially uh, your wavelength times the initial energy spread right, divided by the energy modulation, modulation you're putting in. Right? What this means is if you make a very big energy modulation, since you have to preserve the density of the phase space, you're going to end up with a very narrow stripe here. Right? So you can make arbitrarily short wavelengths this way. The problem is the FEL does not like large energy spreads. The acceptance of the FEL, right, you have a certain energy spread in your beam, the maximum energy spread the FEL can accept is rho. And so if you, if you make a, an energy, uh, energy spread that's bigger than rho, your FEL electronism will not lazy. The, the gain length will get really long and you won't see any amplification. Right? So uh, this uh, single stage harmonic up conversion is only good up to the maybe fifth, tenth harmonic, almost tenth harmonic in the, in the case of Fermi. Right? So, uh, well, the next thing to do is the so-called two-stage HEAG. They call it fresh bunch technique, right? And now what you're doing is very trivial. You're doing this twice, except now you're using two different parts of an electron bunch to do the trick, right? So you start from the back of your electron beam. You do your HEAG up conversion. Now you delay your, it, this generates radiation. It's this blue blob here, right? Now you delay your electrons. Right? The radiation goes at the speed of light. You delay your electrons a little bit, and now your radiation is interacting with the head of your electron beam. Right? So it's, it, if uh, your seed is shorter than half of the bunch, now the radiation is seeing perfectly new, fresh electrons, and it can start all over. And so now you can do a six harmonic here, you can do another six harmonic here, you get to the 36th harmonic. And now with this trick, the Fermi people have managed to go uh, down to about five uh, nanometers. Of course, the efficiency of the FEL goes down short, very short wavelengths, but you know, they can re operate their FEL reliably down to six nanometers. Uh, at LCLS, we're very, very interested in angstrom wavelengths, so you can't keep doing that uh, over and over. Of course, at some point, uh, you run out of space. Uh, and also, noise cascades, right? So if you have an initial noise, it's going to cascade as n squared. So if you start at 266 nanometers and you end at one angstrom, your seeded FEN will not be very seeded. So what you can do is, uh, at very short wavelength, is something called self-seeding. And uh, uh, what you do is you, you, have, uh, you split your undulator in two parts, and halfway through it, you put a monochromator. Right? Now, as long as you're stopping your process before saturation, right, your electrons uh, after, uh, after the monochromator are still going to be fresh enough to trigger the instability. Right? And you don't have to stop, stop too far from saturation, even a factor 10 from saturation is already uh, good enough. Um, and this is what we do at LCLS. There's a, we have a, a chicane to buy, of course, you don't want to hit your uh, diamond crystal with uh, very high energy electrons. So you bypass the uh, crystal with the chicane. And also the chicane compensates for the delay that's introduced by the monochromator itself. And now you have, uh, uh, well, in the case of a crystal mo uh, monochromator, you have like a, a broadband uh, pre-pulse and then a narrow band with pulse uh, trailing. And you use the narrow band with, uh, to trigger the FEL instability again. And now you get to saturation, you get this nice, your blue curve is this nice self-seeded uh, uh, X-ray FEL, right? And um, this way you can increase the spectral brightness by about a factor of five. Um, because of course your bandwidth is much narrower, you also pay a price in power because you're only using effectively half of the undulator to, uh, for your FEL. Or you're starting from, not from noise, but you lose a lot of, uh, power in the monochrom uh, monochromatization uh, uh, process. Okay, uh, now we're getting, this is more uh, uh, forward-looking uh, uh, FELs, right? So um, this was an idea from a scientist here, like Gennady Stupakov, uh, a very bright accelerator physicist. And he thought of a fancy seeding scheme that's kind of the uh, best of both worlds between multi-stage HEAG and single-stage HEAG, right? We know that uh, single-stage HEAG is very sensitive to energy spread. Two-stage HEAG is very sensitive to noise amplification, right? So what he does, what he suggested is, well, you take your electron beam, you make this energy modulation. Now, you disperse it a lot. 
you make a very instead of standing the stripes upside down, you 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 know make you uh, make the electrons go all the way to the neighboring uh, uh, buckets to the neighboring wavelengths, right? And what it does, since you have many periods in your modulation, it makes these uh, stripes. Now these stripes aren't very useful, except now you come in with a second laser, and when you stand your second modulation upside down, you get all these nice stripes, right? And so now what happens is you're generating very high harmonics because these are very narrow uh, lines in your phase space, right? So you project these in time, you get very narrow current spikes, which means micromunching at very short uh, wavelengths. But you're doing so with a smaller energy spread that it would take if you're doing it with HEAG. And also, and this is a little more uh, subtle, it's less noise to, it's, sorry, it's less sensitive to noise amplification because essentially the phase of this laser doesn't matter. This laser is only giving you these fancy stripes in uh, your energy and time uh, space. But uh, essentially the, the phase of the microbunching is locked to the second laser, right? So you only have, laser, you only have noise cascading from the second laser. And uh, this, it's never been uh, truly tested in a high gain FEL. Uh, there was an experiment done in China, the third harmonic, which isn't very meaningful because in the third harmonic, HEAG works better than echo. Uh, however, uh, um, a group here at, a, at, a, at the NLCTA at SLAC, it's a small uh, uh, accelerator test facility. Uh, it's in the research yard. They managed to show coherent emission down to the 75th harmonic of a two micron laser. They didn't show amplification, the, their beam isn't bright enough and the undulator isn't long enough to show amplification. They, they, amplification. they only generate some microbunching and show the uh, coherent radiation out of it. But then you can see on your spectrometer down to 32 nanometers starting from two microns, you see this nice uh, coherent spike in the spe spikes in the spectrum. Uh, and all of this, of course the uh, echo, when you go to very short wavelengths, you have a lot of harmonics that are uh, one over the, num the harmonic number apart from each other, right? So when you, sh when you send this into a an FEL, you have to make sure that this is broader than the FEL gain, which normally it is. Oh, and last but not least, subject dear to my heart, it's a uh, two-color free electron laser. Uh, uh, a lot of you are familiar with pump probe experiments where you use a, a some laser to excite some uh, process in your sample, and then you come in with the X-rays and you probe that, probe that process. Uh, you know, nobody is uh, preventing you, at least now, from doing the same thing, but exciting your sample with X-rays, right? So if you want to excite some, very, some high energy, you know, some core, uh, uh, core level, core, core electronic level, some, you want to study radiation damage, what you need is uh, uh, two X-ray pulses uh, uh, of different energy and controllable delay. And uh, sure enough, uh, there's in the last two or three years, uh, everybody got really excited about two colors. There's like 10 different ways of doing it. Uh, but at LCLS, we, uh, we can do it in two ways. And uh, uh, well, if you look at your uh, uh, resonant condition, right? You have your uh, undulator period, you have your uh, magnetic field, and you have your, your beam energy, right? The undulator period is not something you can change. Once you build your undulator, that's, it's, it is what it is. But your magnetic field and the electron beam are both tunable. So those are the two parameters you play with if you want to make uh, uh, two colors in your free electron laser. So there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first one is uh, what we call the twin bunch FEL. Uh, well, historically, excuse me, historically, this is the first one. And uh, what you do is you use a single electron bunch, you split the undulator in two parts, and now you use your electron bunch to make one color, you delay the electrons with a chicane, and here you make your second color, right? And uh, as long as you don't saturate your FEL, this, uh, you know, is we're going to be happily making two colors. This is nice and easy to set up. It gives you very broad tunability because if, like at SACLA, if you have a, a variable gap undulators, then you can make these two colors whatever you want, whatever arbitrary separation you want, right? So it's very useful if you want to excite one, uh, uh, one edge and probe at a different edge. Uh, we will be able to do this at LCLS with the new undulators in a couple of years. Um, the, of course, the limitation of these is that uh, you can't saturate either of the two, right? So for applications, oh boy, sorry. Uh, for applications that require a lot of power, then your best bet is to make two electron bunches and then uh, each have each bunch emit its own pulse. Now you uh, 
you don't get you don't get arbitrary tunability. You still have a certain energy acceptance in your uh, transport system, but you get a lot of power. So there's, if you're interested in true color FELs, again, there's a, by now there's ten different ways to do it. It's a pretty pretty active subject. If you're interested in using it, uh, please uh, let us know. And uh, that's all. Thank you, Igor, for Thank the you. great talk. Um, so we're running a little late, so maybe there's a time for one question, but if you want to stick around, he's going to be around for a while. So if you have questions, and hopefully he'll make the, the slides and the notes available, uh, we'll figure a way to, to pass them to you. Uh, so is there any questions um, about FELs? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, um, I purposely so didn't say anything. Oh, oh, yeah, can you repeat the question in the microphone? Just that you didn't mention the technology of the superconducting cavities which come at LCLS2 and uh, yeah. European XFL. So will that come in the summer school as well? Well, um, actually, I'm not sure. The, I didn't mention anything because uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's not my expertise, and second, it doesn't really change the physics. This was a lecture about the physics of FELs. It doesn't change what happens in the amplifier if you should, if you have 100,000 beams per second or, or 100, right? It's, uh, the physics is always the same. That's why I didn't go into the detail. I'm not sure if there, is there going to be a lecture on superconducting technology? Yeah, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, but I, uh, if you get in touch with me, I can, I can uh, get you in touch with the people that work on that and you can get some. Yeah, maybe I missed it, but what was the typical range of uh, gain lens and the slippage lens? Yeah, um, well, so the, uh, you can see the undulator is about 120 meters of LCLS, right? So the, the gain length uh, uh, of LCLS, uh, well, uh, it's a few meters. It, de since it depends on energy and on a bunch of other parameters. So as you work at different uh, energies, it's, uh, it changes. But it's about a couple of meters at soft X-rays and uh, uh, on a good day at hard X-rays, you can make it as short as three and a half meters, but typically it's four and a half or five. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so you, you said there are three ways to trigger um, this instability, and you talked about two, the shot noise, of course, and, and the seeding, so what's the third and what is well, the, third the outlook is, on the application? Yeah. The third only exists conceptually. In practice, uh, the third would be to have an initial energy modulation, right? But if you think about it, um, a chicane, a dispersive section doesn't cost any money compared to an undulator, right? So if you go to your, uh, uh, if, you, if you go to this scheme, for example, right? You could, in principle, just do the first part and just let the natural dispersion of the undulator do that job, right? But it would be very inefficient because you can do the same work with the chicane in, in one meter and for very little money. Instead, it would take you, you know, several meters of undulator to, to do the same, right? So in general, whenever you have an energy modulation that's coming from upstream, it's always useful to force, it, force the phase space to go to, to make these vertical stripes and get a very big micro bunching and then start from there. It's, it's just a more efficient way to do it. So the, experimentally, there isn't really a third, uh, a third option. It's just conceptually. It's the, in, in the mathematical model, there's a third variable in your linear system that triggers the FEL, except we never use it. All right, maybe it's time to take a break uh, before the next lecture by Philippe. Um, there's going to be, I think there's coffee outside, right? Uh, let's thank Ago again and, and Mike. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.